I'm losing the light. Hey, it's Brian of London here. And it's getting dark so early. Uh, I'm at the beach. So what happened today in London at the Old Bailey? Tommy Robinson's case. Wow, I think that there is some serious, serious problems going on uh, in the upper echelons of the British political and legal systems because that, of all the things I, I didn't expect today, I did not expect an instant bounce back to the Attorney General. So who is the Attorney General in England? Um, well, the Attorney General, as far as I can see, oversees the Crown Prosecution Service and the Serious Crime Office. And it's a almost cabinet position, but not cabinet. But sometimes the Attorney General can sit in on cabinet meetings. And as far as I can see, well, this puts it at the boundaries of polit polit politics and the judiciary. Things are not as clearly defined in British uh, political and legal systems as they are in America. There's not this sort of, there isn't a written constitution in the same way that you have in America. So the lines are very much more blurred. So by bouncing it back to the Attorney General, which I think is legally the right thing to do, the case was too complicated for a single judge to just listen to, be prosecutor, and then make a decision. That's why it was a disaster in Judge Marzen's court in Leeds, and that's why it's a disaster if they were to do it again at the High Court today at the Old Bailey. It, it, you cannot hear this case because it is not open and shut. It is not clear, it's not clear that Tommy breached a reporting restriction. It's not clear what the reporting restrictions the judge in Leeds, Judge Marzen, was allowed to put on his own case. It's, none of this is clear. And so if you've got someone like Tommy, who at least now has raised enough money to mount a proper defense, the judiciary is having a problem because they expected him to just say, oh, I don't want to go back to prison. I'll plead guilty to something, then they can assign me a two month sentence. And that added to the three months I got in Canterbury, which he should not have got in as well. That sentence in Canterbury and that conviction in Canterbury was very, very dodgy, but he didn't fight it then. They were hoping he would just plead guilty to something, anything, it doesn't matter what, just anything that could give, give him the shortest possible custodial sentence to trigger the Canterbury, to trigger the three months, and then they could say, well, he's already served two and a half months, it's all done, you're good to go, bye-bye, it's over with. But by Tommy saying, no, I'm not pleading guilty to anything, I did nothing wrong, and standing on his convictions because he did nothing wrong, the judiciary is stuffed. They are totally stuffed. They cannot have a single judge just listen to this. The arguments presented in that brilliant, brilliant, brilliant witness statement that Tommy wrote. And listen, for all those of you who don't know Tommy, Tommy might not have put pen to paper and written the words, but nobody does that in their own legal things. But I can tell you from speaking to him many times, the words on that page are Tommy's words. They're buffed up a little bit, the language is a little bit better, there's a bit of legalese in there. But that is how Tommy's mind works represented in that document which is his witness statement which is what he read out to that enormous crowd outside the old bailey and let's talk about a crowd outside the old bailey i have never ever seen a public address system or people setting up for a demonstration of people outside the old bailey let alone having two and a half thousand or two thousand four hundred or anything more than the bbc would say dominic cassini 400 people, are you having a laugh? Do you actually love being called fake news and an enemy of the people, BBC? Because when you have a crowd of more than two and a half thousand people, all of whom have families, all of, all of whom have friends, all of whom have Facebook and Twitter and Periscope, they're all sending out these pictures. There's, there's, there's pictures of this enormous crowd stretching off to infinity and you're saying it's 400 people. There were 400 people in the first 10 rows. It's, it's 25 people uh, across. Go back 20, 25 people. You've already, 
none, none of what you said makes sense, BBC, Sky, Lizzie did, and none of you. So we all know you're lying. And every time you lie a little bit more about Tommy Robinson, uh, you pick another, another one person, goes and watches the first 20 minutes of Tommy Robinson's speech uh, at um, Oxford Union or his band speech from York. And every time that happens, you are dead. Your publication is dead. Your cover as a responsible journalist is blown wide open and we see you for the propagandists that you all are. So back to this. I have never ever seen a PA system set out outside the Old Bailey because it's criminal cases. People just don't kind of hold press conferences about criminal cases. No, the speeches were political. The persecution of Tommy is political and it's being held in a criminal court. The British justice system is being used to politically persecute people. Do you get that? This is, this is North Korea stuff. This is Iran stuff. This is Saudi Arabian stuff. That, that, you're, you're only one step before because we know he's been sent to prison and he's been attacked in prison. This is not very far away from luring somebody into an embassy and then either cutting them up with bone saws or whatever the Saudi Arabians did to Khashoggi. Um, this is the British system. You send him to prison on chumped up charges and then you let Muslim gangs kill him. That's, that's what you're proud of, Great Britain, or once Great Britain? No. So the result today, referring this to the Attorney General. So the Attorney General now has to figure out, out of that hour and 15 minute live stream, where's the crime? Where's the crime? We've been going since May 25th now, and they haven't found the crime. They're looking everywhere for the crime. There was no crime. Tommy didn't commit a crime. And worse than that, now it goes to the Attorney General. Now the Attorney General's got a huge problem because he has to think in terms of legal precedence. Britain doesn't have this American constitution system. Britain doesn't have this, the, the, you know, uh, Congress shall pass no law that. Th th there's, there isn't this written ancient, or not so ancient in the American sense, um, restrictions on the power of the government. So now, if the Attorney General continues prosecuting Tommy, if the Attorney General manages to find in that one hour, 15 minutes, some infraction of some law that is a legal law, because if Tommy just broke a reporting restriction that shouldn't have been there in the first place, well, how's the Attorney General going to cope with that? Is he going to sanction Judge Marsden for putting it on? We don't know. And then that same weekend that Tommy went to prison, we know that Lizzie Dearden broke the reporting restrictions. And not only did she break the reporting restrictions, she was cavalier about it. She and her publication, the blog, The Independent, they refused to take down an article having been told they were in breach of reporting restrictions. She flouted the reporting restrictions. Lizzie Dearden was contemptuous of the court, telling her, you are breaking contempt of court rules. She was contemptuous of the court. So if they prosecute Tommy, how on earth are they not going to refer that case to the Attorney General? How? How? Because British law is built on precedence. If they manage to find Tommy guilty of a crime worthy of jail, when all through, and this is in his witness statement, it's great stuff, newspaper after newspaper, all of them, Guardian, Daily Mail, Independent, they've all at one point or another broken a reporting restriction and been fined, 5,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds, whatever it is. The journalists themselves are never ever held personally liable. Of course, it's always the publication. That's just how the law should work in Britain. So finding Tommy personally responsible and then putting him in torture and solitary confinement for two and a half months, this is unprecedented. Now, what happens if the Attorney General cannot make a case? What happens if he spends the next six months trying to find a case and then tries to quietly drop it? Well, there's no quiet now with Tommy. You raised his profile to the stratosphere. I remember that first Friday when he was arrested. That, that Friday, I was panic-stricken, okay? 
those of us who've been around and about in the background, we were, I was, I was panicking. I thought, this is it. He is really going to be sent to prison and deaded. And the thing that changed, what, what actually happened was Ezra rolled back into town. Uh, Tommy's guys, they managed to get themselves onto Infowars, which was a big deal, and onto Alex Jones's channel. I, I mean, I won't say a bad thing in this case about Alex Jones because he got the word out fast. America was aware, and that raised the noise. You had that enormous, enormous petition worldwide, hundreds of thousands of signatures. That, that was a spark. So Judge Marsden has raised Tommy's profile to the stratosphere. I mean, two and a half thousand people on a weekday in central London. It, it, it's, 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 it's crazy level uh, uh, stuff. So can the attorney general wait a few months and then just quietly drop it? No. Any drop is going to be very noisy from our side. Main press will, will keep quiet about it and none of them will go back and correct their erroneous articles and point out to their readers that Tommy did nothing wrong. But more and more and more people will find Tommy, will find what he says, will actually watch his videos. And when that happens, they're converted. So today was a win. I think Tommy has now moved even more into a Trump territory of a win-win. Okay, if they continue the prosecution, they're gonna have a very tough time making a case that will stick. If they drop the prosecution, well, enormous victory enormous victory um so it's win-win from here on it's win-win now i'd really like it all to be resolved before christmas so he can you know get on with his life but i think he knows and his mindset now he knows i am not in serious jeopardy immediately i've got a long stretch now before this will be resolved and they're gonna have a tough time Read his witness statement in full. Read the whole thing. Try and pick a hole in it. Try and find where you could find something to prosecute him on relating to that one hour, 15 minute video. I've watched it so many times and obviously the Crown Prosecution Service have. And even, and this, was, this, is, this is so key. On the Friday he was sent to prison. On the Tuesday, Judge Marson is having a discussion in his court with a representative of the Crown Prosecution Service. And they're talking about whether, because the, 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 the men, the defendants at that time, the now guilty child rapists, their lawyers obviously came forward and tried to get the case thrown out based on Tommy's live stream. But the Crown Prosecution Service and the judge both just threw that away in an instant because there was nothing prejudicial in what Tommy said. And even if there had been, the jurors shouldn't have been looking at it. And even in that case, the, the case was, the, the verdicts had been, the, the, the jury, I think, had retired. And even, or had given its verdicts. And even in that case, they were only talking about the third connected trial. It just, there's nothing there. Tommy didn't break the rules. Now, what's really interesting is how, for a long time, at the media does seem to be conspiring not to report rape gang cases which are predominantly Muslim contemporaneously. What I mean is, normally, when there's a chart trial ongoing in the UK, it's not quite the circus that America is, but you can report ongoing what is going on in a court case. You can send a reporter into court and the court reporter sits and listens and writes notes, can't make a sketch or take a photo or record it, but makes notes and says, today, this witness said this about the defendant, that he raped her and raped her and raped her. And this witness said he raped her and raped her and raped her. And this witness said this one raped her and raped her and raped her. All of those details could be written down and they could come out every single day during a six week trial. And then when you get to the defense, the same reporter would say, and the defendant said he wasn't there at the time, and the defendant said he didn't do it, and, 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 and. But all of this should come out day by day in a big trial, in an important trial, a trial with public interest. All of that should be coming out every single day. What's happened for the last four years with these Muslim rape gang trials? 
almost no contemporaneous reporting. Now, some of that is because of reporting restrictions. But guess what? You can't even find out which cases had reporting restrictions because it's restricted. So we, we can look, though, we can say this case ended. Was there any reporting up to that point? No. Generally, no. Just on the day that the case ends, bing, reports. Oh, terrible, terrible, terrible. Wouldn't it, isn't it bad? Isn't it bad? Oh, oh, oh. That's it. Next day, back to talking about Kim Kardashian's butt. We don't get the contemporaneous reporting. And that's the point Tommy was making in that live stream in Leeds, that, that this enormous case, one of the biggest they've had so far, was completely unknown to the vast majority of people in Britain. So he's made that point, And now that case... And the whole, good God, was that a drop of rain? Um, the whole, the whole, not scandal, I don't know, the, the, the words are not big enough. The shocking reality of Muslim rape gangs for 30 or 40 years in Britain, it's starting to become internationally known. And that is thanks to Tommy. And it is thanks to Tommy leading the EDL in protests that Andrew Norfolk wrote his groundbreaking piece and that other journalists started to have the balls to write about stories and connect the dots between stories that they'd known about for years. Yes, it is down to the EDL. If the EDL had not been marching across towns and cities of the UK, they wouldn't have wanted to cover it. And they still don't want to cover it. And that's why I believe the media collude with the judiciary. Either they put reporting restrictions in place or the media self-impose reporting restrictions. And the only way around that is citizen journal journalism. If you live in one of those towns and there's a rape gang trial going on in your town, you can go into the court and at the end of the day, you can tweet about it unless there are reporting restrictions. But I can't tell you which cases have reporting restrictions because there is no way to look up which cases currently have reporting restrictions. Unbelievable, isn't it? And that's actually one of the points Tommy makes in his witness statement was that he went into the court to try and get the reporting restrictions, which should have been written on a, on a piece of paper on the door. They were not there. So Tommy did nothing wrong. He's another step closer to proving he did nothing wrong. And the government is going to have a really tough time now. And I am just so pleased about that. Trying to get the Attorney General to figure out what the hell he can charge Tommy with that's serious enough to justify the two and a half months of solitary confinement he's already served. That's it. Anyway, I'm Brian of London. I'm at the beach in Hertzlia. Uh, it's actually kind of trying to rain. I am feeling the odd drop, but uh, I'm so pleased for Tommy. Well done, mate. Thank uh, and, and thank you to everyone who turned up there. I kind of half wished I'd jumped on a plane, but life is a, sometimes a bit too complicated for me to be able to do that. Well done to Avi Yemeni coming all the way from, uh, from Australia and to all the other people who travelled for it. Amazing show. Great 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 show you put on there i really i was doing something mindless and tedious in my office today and i had that on on 14 screens brilliant all right brian of london here at the beach in hertzlia wishing everyone a good evening and um go and get a beer <laughs>